and welcome to Data Byte 141. We are celebrating the launch of Digital Technology and Democratic Theory, a new book published by the University of Chicago Press. My name is Robin Kaplan, and I'm a researcher here at Data in Society. Uh, for the visually impaired, we're trying a new thing. I'm a white woman with long uh, brown hair, um, so you can uh, form a better image of who, I, who is speaking with you today. I'll be your co-host, supported by my team behind the curtain, uh, CJ, Rigo, and Eli, as well as our partners at Stanford PAX, co-producers of today's event. I'm also one of the authors of this volume today, though, so I'm going to be doing double duty, and I'll be showing up later on the panel as, as well. I have the um, pleasure of sharing the stage with Lucy Bernholtz and Rob Reich, um, two of the editors from the collection, as well as two contributing authors. Uh, Sita Pena Gingadaran and Arkan Fung. For those of you who don't know us yet, Data and Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology in society. You can find out more about us at datasociety.net. The Stanford Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society is a global interdisciplinary research center and publisher of the Stanford Social Innovation Review. Stanford PAX develops and shares knowledge to improve philanthropy, strengthen civil society, and address societal challenges. By creating a shared space for scholars, students, and practitioners, Stanford PAX informs policy and social innovation, philanthropic investment, and nonprofit practice. And you can find out more about them at paxcenter.stanford.edu. So we're gonna be spending the next hour together, I think actually a little bit more than an hour. So I wanna all get grounded. If you're joining us from a computer, uh, use the features at the bottom of your screen to participate. So you can ask and uh, upvote questions via the Q&A function. You can use the closed captioning function for subtitles. You can view links and prompts in the chat window and we do tend to share a lot. So um, just you can just make sure you're, you're staying updated there. And we also want to note that this event is being recorded and will be shared afterwards. And you can follow the conversation on Twitter with the hashtag DigTechDemTheory. And I think we'll, we'll share the hashtag in the chat as well. It's a bit of a mouthful. We'd like to start all of our events with a digital land acknowledgement. So Data in Society was founded on the ancestral territory of the Lenape people, a network of rivers and islands in the Atlantic Northeast we now refer to as New York City. Today, we're connected via a vast array of servers and computers situated on stolen land. We acknowledge the dispossession of indigenous land by the data-driven logic of white settler expansion and uplift, and uplift the sovereignty of indigenous people and data. We commit to dismantling a modern day colonialism and its material implication on our digital worlds. And you can visit nativeland.ca and uh, use the Q&A feature to share whose land you're joining us from. So now I wanna turn this over to one of the editors of the volume, Rob, um, to get us into the context of today's event. So hi, Rob. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much, Robin. And uh, for the visually uh, impaired, uh, my name is Rob Reich. I'm a faculty member at Stanford University. I'm a middle-aged uh, white male professor. Um, you know, Stanford students, I think most students refer to themselves uh, sometimes as rising sophomores, rising juniors, rising seniors. I like to refer to myself as a declining professor, a declining egghead. Um, I'm happy to be here today, despite that self-description. Uh, I want to offer just a very brief framing idea for this entire conversation. So, um, of course, on all of our minds these days is uh, a question about whether it was appropriate for the various social media platforms to deplatform um, now former President Trump, uh, whether or not the uh, banning of uh, Parler to cloud access or to the app stores was indeed a good decision. That's just the most recent version of many of these questions that have beset um, all of us for at least the past decade. And uh, what I want to suggest that this book allows for us to do is to bring a certain type of sober, mature framework to thinking about questions at the intersection of the digital technologies that have revolutionized our lives and the democratic societies in which so many of us exist. Um, we want to bring a non-polemical orientation to the conversation in which we're not advocates of liberation technology or techno-utopians, but neither are we 
committed to the idea that Facebook is a destroyer of democracies and that tech companies in Silicon Valley and elsewhere do nothing more than hijack our attention um, for bad. So um, one quick note about how this volume came together, because I think it's important to register this. Many edited volumes are nothing more than a stapled together collection of workshop or conference papers, or occasionally a kind of celebratory volume of, of, of a particular scholar. Um, by contrast, this volume was done in a different way. We spent, um, we editors spent uh, um, six months putting together um, a cast of contributors who then assembled for an 18 month long series of workshops. We met on three separate occasions for multiple days across disciplinary lines with the idea that we would try to explore where different disciplinary orientations from political science to philosophy, to history, to sociology, to communications and media studies including as well engineers, um, where there were common concepts and common ideas at these intersections between digital technology and democratic theory. There was no editorial agenda about what conclusions to reach, but rather we sought through these workshops to come to some common views. This book is not, however, a manifesto. It represents the different conclusions of different scholars that are the product of these cross-disciplinary conversations. So I hope with that you get a sense about the volume as a whole and we'll get um, a much closer view of a few of the contrib con contributions to the volume now. So I turn the floor over to my colleague, Lucy. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Robin, and welcome everyone. Um, I'm Lucy Bernholtz. I'm a middle-aged white woman with gray hair, red glasses, and there's a uh, beautiful picture of redwood forests behind me. Um, and I'm calling in and want to acknowledge uh, the Mowek, I'm calling in from the land of the Mowekma Ohlone uh, people, which is who are the original stewards and caretakers of the land that Stanford occupies today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Indigenous people are present and thriving despite our occupation of their ancestral lands. And I acknowledge their existence and continued, um, uh, continued existence. Let me uh, pick up where Rob left off about the book. Um, you know, books take a long time to write, and sometimes you get lucky as to when they come out. Um, a lot of the topics and themes, as Rob mentioned, um, that we were wrestling with for the last uh, few years are now very much on people's mind. I'm an historian by training. I don't think of myself as a democracy theorist, but one of the things we tried to do with the way we went around putting this book together and, and the final volume is to think of it as an examination of these intersections between democracy theories and, di and digital technology. Each of those spaces taking each other very seriously and calling for expanded and intersectional approaches to theorizing about democracy in a digital age. I think of this as no more democracy theory without digital dependencies. <laughs> and then when you think about the digital technology side of things, there are a lot of different logics for the digital technologies that we use and are surrounded by. The mass market ones are largely derived from what I think of as a extractive capitalist logic um, and a surveillance state logic. But there are alternative logics out there and there are technologies built on them. And particularly um, um, as we think about where we are today, there's a lot of talk about new infrastructure. I think it's in particularly opportune time to engage with um, the potential and possibilities of different logics for uh, digital technologies. The book is by no means comprehensive in scope. Actually, as I look back at it now, I'm not sure that one volume could ever be that. It covers topics from governance by distributed infrastructure to the role of associational life, the role of journalism to the kinds of new skills we all need to thrive. The particular authors who've joined us here, Sita, Arkan, Robin, and myself, um, look at the public sphere, corporate governance, silence, exclusion, and refusal, and the role of community power. But the book covers a broader range of topics than that. And finally, it lays out a research agenda for more work, for scholarship that we hope uh, the book will inspire, and, and particularly the value of um, interdisciplinary scholarship, 
and also a, a little bit of a sense. Uh, I don't think of myself as a democracy theoretician now, but I've played one on TV for the last several years. <laughs> and I've certainly, my own work um, is much richer for that. And I think there's room for people for many disciplines in that conversation. So I'm going to uh, ask each of our panelists to take about six or seven minutes to introduce the substance of their chapter to give um, our listeners something to, to uh, chew on. I ask you to jump right in with the Q&A and we'll be uh, turning to the Q&A after a couple of rounds of, of questions from me. So let me start with Archon. Archon, uh, you and your co-author, Josh Cohen, uh, in your chapter of the book, take on the role of the public square in democracies or the public sphere. And what aspects of digital technology come into play in your chapter and into this idea of the public sphere? And what big questions did you address in the chapter? Great. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. And thanks, uh, Robin and Lucy and Rob, for bringing us together and, and having this great discussion at this moment in which this topic is, I think, on a lot, a lot of people's minds. Um, so our main question, we, we began the chapter. What motivated us to write the chapter was to think more clearly about all of the many criticisms of social media today, especially criticisms that social media is bad for democracy, right? And so uh, what we set out to do in this chapter is gain some more clarity about what exactly these complaints are, what are they are, are about. And so how we do that is that we, we aim to do two things. First of all, develop a yardstick, a kind of normative yardstick for what a good functional public sphere, that is a media sphere of news, information, and communication looks like in a democracy. Like what, if you're in the Middle Ages or in the 20th century or in the 21st century, what are those normative standards and values? Um, and we asked like, good for what? Good for democracy is our main uh, question, right? What kind of public sphere is good for democracy because we believe that a successful democracy requires supporting informational conditions. And so we try to lay out those goalposts in a general and careful way. So that's the first thing is construct this normative yardstick. And the second thing, tie out the yardstick to kind of roughly measure the quality of the public sphere in two different eras. The first era is kind of the mid 20th century post-war mass media public sphere. And then the second public sphere that we want to use the yardstick on is our current environment of social media infused uh, digital information. And in application and in, in using this yardstick, roughly what we find is that the mass media public sphere did some things better than the current public sphere, such as seeking truth and for people to communicate civilly. But the digital public sphere does some things better than the mass media public sphere. It offers opportunities for a much wider range of views and for more people, especially those without resources and connections, to say things, to put their views out into the public sphere and for other folks to respond to them. And so just to give a little more detail, I wanna spend just the rest of my time, the few minutes, uh, giving people a sense of what that yardstick is. And so our yardstick has two pieces, a set of rights and opportunities, and you might think of that as the structure or the affordances of the public sphere. And the second category, the second part of the yardstick is norms and dispositions. Is, and that's how people uh, themselves roughly behave in the public sphere. And so the first category has five things and the second category has three. So let's just talk about the rights and opportunities. Right, And where do you get your rights and opportunities from? Some of it is from platform design. Some of it is from laws and regulation. Some of it is actually from how other people treat you in the public square or the public sphere. And so we think that there are five important things. One is a right to free expression, which is kind of a First Amendment value. You shouldn't be just shut down because of your point of view or what you say. The second, and this is an important one, is that everybody, each individual should have good and equal chances for expression, for saying things in the public sphere. So for those of you who um, were living and communicating before the internet was uh, widely diffused, it, unless you, it, people who uh, 
had a column in the newspaper had much better chances to get their views out there in the public sphere than me as a graduate student. I'd write these angry op-eds, submit them, and they would all get rejected. So my chances for expression in that public sphere were very, very low, even though I you know, had a college degree and stuff. Um, the third criterion is access. So everybody participating in the public sphere should have access to reliable and instructive information. And so in the, in the internet world, I think there is access to much wider array of reliable information than there was in the mass media public sphere, but our access might be reduced a little bit because there's a whole lot of noise too, right? Uh, the fourth criterion, the fourth part of the yardstick on the rights and opportunities is diversity. As someone entering the public sphere in a democracy, I should have the opportunity to hear a wide variety of views on matters of public importance. And here again, I think that the social media public sphere does much, much better than the mass media public sphere, partially because most of the speakers in the mass media public sphere were professional journalists who had gone to the same schools, been socialized according to the same norms and behaviors. And um, in the United States and in Europe, some of their main sources were government sources. So the sources were largely homogenous and the speakers were largely homogenous in their viewpoints. Whereas now, as we all know, there's a wide, wide variety, diversity of views on whether or not global climate change is happening or not, on whether one should wear masks or not. On any conceivable subject, there's a wide diversity of views. And then finally, communicative power. When I enter the public sphere, I should be able to uh, do things, find other people who have ideas similar to mine and join with them and maybe organize a, a march for black lives. Or if I think this, uh, the uh, vote has been stolen, I might wanna organize with other people in a peaceful protest to complain about that. And so a digital public sphere or any public sphere ought to provide the opportunities for people to exercise communicative power. And then, find, and then the second part of the yardstick is really, really important, right? The first part is about laws and platform designs and algorithms, if you like, in, in today's world. But the second part is about how we behave, a lot about how we behave as users uh, uh, of the digital public sphere or uh, it being in the public square. And uh, many of us in the 1990s thought that the internet would be very, very good for democracy. We had uh, kind of quasi utopian or a bordering on utopian views about how liberating it was going to be for everyone. And I think um, many of us now think that was just a mistaken view. And a big part of that mistake is I think we underestimated how awful we as human beings are when interacting on a platform. And so never underestimate how awful you are or I am, because if you do, then you'll come to this utopian view about how great a free internet is, um, which it hasn't been so far. And so uh, if the public sphere is gonna be good, we have to be better. And so these are three ways in which we think people interacting on the public sphere need to regulate their behavior and be better. The first is we should have a high regard for the truth, right? We should try to separate the truth from things that aren't true and not amplify falsity. And the 20th century public sphere was actually much better at this because journalists were very well trained and uh, made it part of their professional mission to seek truth and to expose falsity. And they got pretty good at it, right? They didn't get everything right. They got a lot of stuff wrong, but that was part of what they were trying to do, unlike many users of the digital public sphere today. It's maybe more important for a lot of us to feel good or to tweet things that we agree with than it is to be truth regarding, right? The second kind of normative um, disposition that we should have, the normative regulator that we should each have when we're on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, is we should be oriented toward the common good. We should be able to, we should be saying things that try to uh, at least move all of us forward, even if pe even people who really, really disagree with us. And I can say a little bit more about what that looks like um, in the Q&A. And then finally, the third thing is civility. We should treat people civilly not in the sense that we should be nice to them or polite to them. Maybe we shouldn't because maybe they're not good people or, uh, or they're out to hurt other people. But what civility means 
is that we should treat them with enough respect to listen to their views and maybe we reject them, but at least try to understand what they're saying and then to explain ourselves to them, right? So that's what the norm of civility means is treat someone else as somebody initially who you take seriously enough to try to actually figure out what they're saying. And if you think it's um, just not true or uh, you, uh, you have a different perspective, that's fine. But listen, and then also you have an obligation to explain. You can't just show people the hand, right? Showing people the hand would be a violation of the civility norm, right? And so though that's the uh, normative yardstick of rights and opportunities and norms and dispositions. Um, uh, we think that there's a lot of ways in which the current digital public sphere falls short of those norms and dispositions and opportunities and rights. And we think that it's really important that all of us, all hands on deck, government, citizens, platform companies, get to work reconstructing our digital public sphere in a way that conforms to that normative yardstick. Thanks, Arkan. And I see there's a number of questions coming in already. So uh, no, no hesitancy from the audience, which is great. Please keep dropping them in. Let me, let me turn now to Sita. Um, your chapter uh, takes a very different approach and looks at communities uh, and their interactions with digital technologies, focusing specifically on issues of exclusion and inclusion, silence and refusal. Um, how does technology fit into your analysis and what big questions did you grapple with? Thanks, Lucy, and to our hosts at Data and Society and to my co-panelists. Um, let me just begin by saying for the visually impaired or for those of you who are joining in uh, by audio transmission only, I'm a very skinny Filipino Indian American woman with black cat eye glasses and a long black ponytail sitting in a, an essentially a storage closet in North London. <laughs> um, so, to answer your questions, Lucy, I actually want to talk about the um, big questions and then sort of back into the question of technology and how um, I've conceptualized it in this chapter and, um, and to provide some additional context uh, to the chapter. So what initially motivated me for this chapter um, is uh, is uh, where questions arising from the work that I do with our data bodies. Um, and I've just put the um, website in the chat. In the chat. Um, our data bodies is a research and organizing collective. And at ODB, our, pra our praxis extends from a recognition that technology intersects all sorts of struggles for racial, economic and social justice. And so we work in between these domains, as well as traversing fields um, outside of those realms, typically outside of those realms, um, digital rights, privacy, surveillance, or um, issues of fairness, accountability, and transparency in uh, data-driven systems. And for five years between, uh, so between 2015 and 2020, our data bodies uh, participated or did a participatory and collaborative research um, project, some of which is reflected in this chapter, um, interviewing folks in the most systematically oppressed um, neighborhoods or groups that are systematically oppressed in vulnerable neighborhoods in Charlotte, Detroit, and Los Angeles. And what struck me in 2018, I think when we first began talking as a group, just kind of seems like a really long time ago now, um, is, and what continues to strike me today is that there are myriad ways in which individuals and groups of people are resisting, rejecting, and refusing the tyranny of technological systems over their lives. And this, I argue in my book chapter, chapter represents a form of digital exclusion. And here I'm thinking, um, and uh, for those of you um, unable to see the screen, I have a slide up that says refusal. And uh, it's a collage of, if you look closely at the images, it's a collage of different individuals um, expressing themselves, um, uh, protesting, a lot of pictures of collage together of protests in the background in those letters uh, uh, that make up the word refusal. So what I argue is that, when um, there, there is a type of refusal of technology 
that is a form of digital self, it's a form of digital exclusion. It's sort of self-exclusion from digital systems or socio-technical systems. And importantly, it's a generative type of exclusion from these socio-technical systems that can get people reimagining the role of technology in their lives, the ways in which technologies do and should govern their lives. So whether in Los Angeles, Detroit, or Charlotte, over and again, over and again in the interviews that we did on the ground, we heard multiple people thinking and talking and confronting technological systems, confronting data-driven systems, confronting the processes of data collection um, that they encounter so many times uh, in a day, in a week, um, and, and, and doing this confrontation in a way that helped them survive, helped them feel dignified, set the record straight, gave them a sense of, of control, and in some cases, take direct aim and agitate against the institutions aiming to force socio-technical systems uh, upon their lives in profoundly unjust ways. So my chapter grapples precisely with that, right? It's sort of the meeting ground of this participatory research and organizing project that we did for five years and, and taking that experience and putting it in conversation and the questions that were arising in that work and putting that in conversation with how we think about technology in relation to this larger project of justice and this larger project of democracy. And so, um, you know, the, the major questions are, how do we see or view these acts of technological refusal, whether they're individual acts of refusal or organized responses or collective acts of refusal against technology? in political terms? How do we see this as a civic action or almost a civic duty or a new form of civil disobedience um, with consequential political reverberations? So I think, and, and, and I, I think there are um, two additional questions that also kind of factored into or in, uh, shaped the, the chapter, which is how do we center experiences of members of marginalized communities in this discussion of the relationship between technology, justice, and democracy, right? Because I think um, maybe one difference, uh, at least in terms of how I kind of orient myself to the public sphere or understand the public sphere is with recognition that there have been systematic forms of exclusion um, since the ideal or historical public sphere was conceived, right, that we've had systematic exclusions from the public sphere, um, and that often uh, these groups that are marginalized, that are exploited, that suffer from systemic violence, that are um, misrecognized on a daily basis, right, that they don't really factor into how we're thinking about information or communication flows, or even um, beyond information and communication, uh, uh, that is, um, you know, these, these two terms that really, uh, I think, anchor much of the thinking around democratic theory and mediated technologies of communication or media of communication. So the second important question was, how do we center uh, the experiences of members of marginalized communities? And then the third question, I think, um, is centered around this idea or, uh, of how do we square what I'm talking about, this agentic form of refusal, technological refusal, um, this sort of generative form of digital exclusion with broader public debate and broader public policy initiatives that have typically characterize digital exclusion as a pejorative thing, right? So when we think about digital exclusion, we're typically thinking about, I don't have access to the internet, right? Which is definitely an important and valid concern and one that has been absolutely highlighted uh, during the pandemic, right? There are other forms of digital exclusion that aren't only about access 
uh, to broadband or availability of broadband, right? There's um, digital exclusion has to do with skills and know-how, right? A sort of literacy related type of digital exclusion. There are exclusions that have arisen with concerns about the ways in which digital technologies track us or target us, right? Sort of this commercial um, targeting. And so privacy concerns are amplified and are a form potentially of digital exclusion. And then there are all of the surveillance concerns, right? That um, can be marginalizing and can be impactful, especially on members of marginalized communities, creating a sort of digital exclusion. And all of these kinds of digital exclusion, these other four digital exclusions are very negative. Um, on top of that, we have a digital exclusion that I think is perpetrated by the sheer wealth of these big technology companies and sort of the economic geographies of these companies and that creating uh, different kinds of uh, exclusions in society. And so if we think about those kinds of exclusions, they're generally negative ones, right? They're pejorative, right? We think of digital exclusion as a negative thing, but what I'm trying to do in this chapter is really kind of recover this idea that I think um, Nancy Fraser, who wrote a lot about the counter public sphere earlier in her career, thinking about how do we kind of ensconce ourselves into, into groups where we can see ourselves and we, where we can see what's happening, um, articulate our concerns, and then express ourselves, express our digital, our, our discontents, and ideally eventually turn that into that communicative power into political power, right? And so being influenced by that, I, um, I have used this idea of technological refusal as, again, this sort of political, this force of political possibility. And um, in that sense, um, I'm a firm believer that technology in the space of um, when we think about marginalization and when we think about injustice and justice and democracy, right? I understand technology in a, a, in a very constructionist way, right? That um, technology isn't just a variable that enters the equation of democracy, right? It's something that is part of a larger set of institutions, practices, norms, social hierarchies, and um, that really affects um, and can exacerbate some of the um, existing problems that members of marginalized communities that face, and yet still they can refuse. So I'll end there um, and we can move to Ron. Thank you, Sita. And the, um, the chapters and the key questions on dignity and power um, uh, is very, very rich. And, and to show the breadth of the book, Robin, your chapter looks at questions of power in a very different way. Um, you look at different approaches to corporate governance and decision-making about content moderation, how those activities relate to democracies writ large. And, and what do you want people to learn from your analysis? Hi, everybody. Um, I first wanted to say how amazing this is. This book was such a long process. This was three years in the making and it was a lot of traveling back and forth, a lot of going back to Stanford specifically. So I'm just so happy that Data and Society could host this, this event for everybody. It just makes me very, very happy. I was also the most junior person in this group by far. So it was like a very overwhelming experience at times and it still is to share the stage with these incredibly brilliant scholars. So I'm just very grateful to be here. Um, so I will be honest, I sat down to write this talk yesterday and it was really tough to go back to all of this material that was so grounded within the context of the last four years. And I think as much of this book uh, as this book was very much spawned by questions about how digital technologies have shaped democracy, uh, particularly, particularly as it related to the Trump era, I think that was really the impetus. I think our job now is to understand how um, many of the issues that gave rise to Trump, white supremacy, political polarization, inequality, um, transcend the, the current digital era, and also where we position platforms in digital technologies as political actors. And I had the privilege of moderating a panel this week with Tressie uh, McMillan Cottom, and um, she really she's she's been influencing my my thinking about my work actually all week. <laughs> but she she noted that part of what we've seen in the last few years is in many ways an extension of how whiteness and power has functioned historically. But we've also seen an expansion in in the boundaries of acceptable political discourse um, in ways that are frankly undemocratic. 
And part of our job now is to redefine those boundaries um, and platforms have, have a role in that. So on that note, I'm just gonna give a bit of a background into why I wrote this piece for the volume. So the chapter is titled The Artisan and the Decision Factory, the Organizational Dynamics of Private Speech Governance. And it's actually based um, largely on a white paper I wrote for Data and Society and released in 2018, which I actually never presented as part of Data and Society. So this is the first time um, called Content or Context Moderation. And this work is part of a broader research project that I'm still engaged in and um, that looks at how platform companies are working to network and distribute responsibility for content policymaking amongst a broad range of stakeholders, including media organizations and fact checkers, civil society organizations, academics and users. And this is a very funny chapter to have in this volume, I think, because it really gets into the like the details of content moderation, uh, which is an odd thing to pair with really big democratic theory. But what I hope this chapter adds is just some acknowledgement of how these theories and goals are interpreted and shaped within the context of the constraints and goals of organizations, um, in this case, platform companies. So the chapter begins with an acknowledgement of something um, that it felt like the world learned in the last two weeks. Um, platforms are private companies and therefore uh, the First Amendment does not apply. I take some time to consider in the chapter why this has been such a hard thing for most people talking about platforms to accept um, because of how dominant a role they're playing hosting the public sphere, which is what Archon and uh, Joshua's chapter speaks to but also because of the optimism and hope we had for these sites early on um, as being able to fundamentally transform democratic participation. And then moving on from an acceptance that these are public spaces uh, privately owned and governed. The chapter then goes into a more detailed examination of these companies and how they develop and enforce their content policies. So I took a comparative approach in this work. I interviewed um, people who worked in policy across 10 major platforms that host speech um, so really all of them, I, I don't even know if I'd be able to list them all from the top of my head, but uh, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon, Vimeo, so from the very, very big to the very, very small. And my real focus was trying to understand how these companies dealt with the types of speech that tend to adapt and shift very quickly online. So, so hate speech and, and false information. Um, my goal was to understand what parts of making policies certain types of platform companies are good at and what types they're bad at and how they kind of engage in this boundary making. So this work was also intended to understand how platforms of various sizes of different business models balance their desire to scale with the real need to learn the specific cultural contexts and, and sometimes even the languages of where they're operating in order to make and enforce content rules. It was inspired in large part at the time by a really fantastic piece of journalism done by ProPublica in 2017, where they discovered that Facebook's um, particular approach to content policy which emphasized scale protected white men, but not black children. And what I found was a remarkable variation in how platforms form their policies. Um, I pulled out three different strategies that I found were spoken about most in my interviews. So the first was an artisanal case by case approach. And I don't use artisanal because I'm a Brooklyn, I'm a millennial uh, currently sitting in Brooklyn. I use it because this is the word that they use. And so I wanted to kind of highlight it. And because it was always contrasted in my interviews um, with the notion of industrial content moderation. And that's what's done by um, the major platforms like Facebook and Google, or yeah, Facebook and Google, where they have hundreds of thousands of people doing this work all around the world. And then that's uh, contrasted with the community reliance strategy that we often associate with platforms like Wikimedia and Reddit. And what I found was that as companies scale, they move from this artisanal model where content policy workers are able to kind of individually consider each flag and concern to the industrial, which tends to emphasize a broad standardized approach uh, with a goal of automation. And what I wanted to convey was that as we think about regulation in this space, we need to carefully consider what type of content governance we, we want to incentivize. Um, are we going to build policies that are based off of the approach taken by companies like Facebook that has a bias towards developing global standards? Or are we going to incentivize kind of a more case by case approach uh, that requires platforms to invest a, a pretty significant amount of resources into how they do it? And I do think it's interesting to note that the platforms can do many of these strategies at once. So the recent deplatforming of Trump was a very context led um, moderation example that was also very informed by shifting power dynamics. Uh, so it's, it's important to really see when platforms are using these different strategies and, and why. So to answer Lucy's question, I want to engage, uh, I want to return back to what Tressie said earlier this week. Um, platforms, like all of us, need to be engaged in redefining the boundaries of acceptable uh, political discourse. Uh, 
For this work specifically, I think it's important to consider the strategies they're engaging in while they do this boundary work, uh, how many resources they're devoting to it, in relation to that, how much of a role we expect them to play in shaping the public sphere compared to other institutions. But I also think it's really important to consider the values that are driving their approach. Um, and what I'm finding is that increasingly they're trying to mimic other institutions as a way to build back their legitimacy as their novelty has worn off. So in some other work I've been doing, I've been analyzing how platforms are in their public rhetoric, often trying to position the work that they're doing in relation to how governments make rules. So they're using terms like precedents, um, building their own Supreme Courts, referring to their own mini legislatures. Uh, they're also at times trying to build off of the norms of media policy, emphasizing rules like uh, values like diversity and localism and representation. And they're also trying to kind of reinsert expertise, touting how they're working with academics, civil society organizations and media. Uh, so they're doing a lot of experimenting right now in terms of how, what, what values are really going to drive their way, like the way that they want to operate going forward. And what's really interesting about it, what's really funny about it is that um, they're <laughs> Uh, they're desperately trying to draw from the same institutions that they were really intent on disrupting. Um, so in that sense, <laughs> and in that sense, they can't just keep trying to prove themselves to us and, and gesture to inclusiveness and pluralism. They also really need to let people in in a real way and not just continue the harms of, of these other institutions. And part of the job that we need to do, and I think that Archon really said that, uh, said this as well, is to continue theorizing, uh, but maybe with a bit more skepticism this time about the role that they should be playing in the public sphere uh, as a way to guide this kind of value development on the part of platforms. So what do we expect from these companies? Um, just, just in the same way that we have with, with media in the past. Thanks, Robin. Um, so there's an, an example of the breadth of the of the book, the volume and the different chapters. And Robin got us started uh, bringing this all to the current moment. Again, the book, you know, takes several years to write a book. But I want to ask each of our panelists to just um, comment on the following, and then we'll go to the the questions and answers that are flowing into the Q and A. But um, how does your chapter speak to what's happening in the U.S. and around the world today? And is there anything um, you might reconsider if we were starting this project right now. Uh, Sita, I'll start with you and then um, Robin, you've touched on this, but you may have more to add and then and final uh, Archon before we go to the audience questions. So Sita. Thanks for that. Um, I, I've, uh, I mean, the events of the last four years have been tremendous and um, I think that looking at where we are today in relation to where we were three years ago when we started engaging in this process, um, I was certainly more optimistic about this concept of technological refusal, right? Mm -hmm. This idea that we can um, collectively kind of um, respond. I mean, there are individual responses that people are, are um, practicing and that those practices are really important and at the same time, we're starting to see an emergence of refusal or practices of refusal emanating from different cities and municipalities around the country. So, you know, with respect to facial recognition or predictive policing or other kinds of technology. Now, um, what's interesting in the last three years is that we've also started to see the rise of things like worker walkouts and um, high wage or high, um, uh, sort of high wage earning tech workers really trying to um, generate some movement around whether it's protesting, uh, you know, Google's contract with um, the Pentagon and Project Maven, or, uh, you know, protesting um, Amazon's uh, contracts with ICE, right, we've seen some pushback within companies. And to some extent, uh, so some of that is genuinely exciting, I think, uh, you know, and at the same time, what I'm also seeing and sensing is that there's, it almost feels like there's a co-optation or an attempt to co-opt this idea of technological refusal by the platforms, by the tech companies, right? That, um, yes, like let's do participatory AI or let's do, uh, you know, sort of people-centered, human-centered um, uh, technological design. And those are important, 
and I don't want to discredit them. And I and I acknowledge that it, within you know the tech industry, there there is a wide swath of people, um, and some of them are doing really good work. It's not just uh, extractive or ex, uh, co co-optive, but at the same time, I think that is um, drawing some energy. Uh, and attention away from the very important work that's happening on the ground as communities are members of especially marginalized communities are really trying to grapple with how do you intersect in the governance of these technical systems that are brought into public safety that are brought into education that are brought into other realms of life and it is really difficult to disentangle. So even in Detroit, where you know most of my um, the empirical focus of my ch chapter lies, I was very optimistic that there was going to be additional momentum and and really exciting pushback against facial recognition within the city of Detroit and potentially in the state of Michigan. Now there has been a lot of tension and a lot of pushback by you know the police and law enforcement and um, politicians as well, and it's a tough struggle. So that that is ongoing and that's continuing and uh, i i can i have a vision of how long that that struggle is going to be and and it's it's going to be really tough yeah thank you and and you bring up also um the pervasiveness of the technology as well as it moves off of our screens and uh into our streets as it were making the both the sites of pushback and resistance and the sites of incursion more pervasive. Um, Robin, was there anything you wanted to add uh, to your comments earlier about how you might reconsider some of what you're what you looked at if we were starting the project today? I think I, I, I mean, that question is very funny for me because I'm still very much engaged in this project. Um, and so it's not it's not something that really the the, the chapter that I did for this um, book was was really the kind of the beginning of, of a lot of this. I think um, a lot of the work that I'm trying to do is, is really trying to understand how platforms are, are, are saying they're distributing power, distributing um, policymaking across a broad range of actors. I think weirdly what I would do a bit differently is I, I tried to take um, a pretty good account of kind of where I sat in that as an academic who does work on, on platforms, but I think I would have been um, kind of way more conscious of that uh, very early on, especially as somebody who um, sits in between academia and, and civil society. Um, and so that's, I think, one, one small thing I'd change. The real challenge for me is that I started this work in, in, in 2015, kind of just before um, this issue really blew up. And the big challenge has been trying to, trying to like do do work on an issue that's continuing to to unfold. So I don't want to say like if I was to do anything differently, I probably wouldn't have done this project. But <laughs> maybe I don't I don't know. It's it's like a it's a tough time to be a media scholar um, right now, uh, especially that does that does work on in this specific area. Thanks, Robin. Arkan, um, same question to you. Anything you'd reconsider uh, if we started today? Yeah, that's great. I'll just answer briefly so we can get to the Q&A. Um, one is uh, platform censorship. I guess at the beginning of the project, I would have been much more opposed to platforms deplatforming Donald Trump. I'm mo somewhat more sympathetic to that now. But on the flip side, I don't actually I haven't talked to anyone who is active on Parler, but I imagine that the experience of uh, Apple and Google and AWS yanking Parler, I, I have to imagine it must feel like something like a Russian dissident with the uh, state of Russia breaking up your printing press, or if you're a Hong Kong dissident, the government of China shutting down your social media account or uh, yanking your website. So I'm just like, I hadn't really considered the, the censorship dimension and both sides of it. And, um, and I'm particularly worried about the second, you know, Donald Trump has plenty of other ways to, he has good access to the public sphere. No question about that with or without Twitter. But, you know, I'm thinking about uh, suburban Georgia regular person who 
uh, thinks that the election did go another way and is talking with eight friends about that. And all of a sudden their platform is shut down by the biggest companies in the world and they have to get hosting in Russia, right? I mean, what is, how do we think about that exactly, right? And then the other thing that follows on that is the urgency. I was kind of thinking, well, okay, the platform thing, they're gonna do what they're gonna do. They're gonna establish moderation councils. They're gonna play around with it. But now they're making big, big consequential decisions all on their own, which have, uh, that, that are dramatically different, I think from uh, you know, two years ago or four years ago. And so I think the, um, the urgency of getting some public grip around reconstituting platform decisions, which constitute the public sphere is of much greater urgency even than, than how I was thinking about it over when we wrote this. Thank you. So turning to the questions from the audience and, and please keep pop, uh, populating the q and I'll start at the top of the upvoted list and then I'm, I'll meld a few because uh, we have about, I think, uh, 15 minutes or so here. But the, the largest question that, that uh, Danny Mendelson asked and a lot of people uh, supported has to do with how each of you is even defining a public square. And you come at it from such different um, directions, but can privately owned companies um, be a public square or is there uh, just a, a mismatch at that level that needs to um, be rethought? I'll let um, any one of you who wants to jump in, jump in first. Yeah, uh, I'll, ju I'll jump in. I think this is a really important question and I'm, there's a bunch of ways to interpret it, but um, just by way of clarification, the public sphere, like how we learn about things, how we make decisions about whether to vote for this candidate or that candidate, how we decide to be an environmental activist or a racial justice activist and get that information has been dominated by private sector actors for a very, 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 very long time, like since the 18th or 19th century, right? So the, the public sphere has been constituted by private companies forever, right? Or, you know, and not, not for literally forever. I mean, and there are some exceptions like BBC and PBS are, publicly owned, but those are small, small parts of our informational environment, right? And um, I think this is not where Danny is coming from, but one thing you've heard recently is, oh, you know, Twitter and Apple and Google and Facebook deplatforming Donald Trump or anywhere, anyone else is absolutely no problem because they're not governed by the First Amendment. They're not, uh, you know, uh, the state should take no action, right? They're, they're not states, they're companies. So of course they can run their businesses any way they want. For, from the perspective of our chapter, that is totally missing the point, right? <laughs> what we wanna do is develop norms and regulations that constitute these big platforms and everybody else who's making the critical infrastructure on, a, what, uh, on which we all depend, good for democracy, not bad for democracy. And for me, the property right of, you know, Apple, Facebook, Google is, is like 12th on my list of considerations of what's important, whereas different democracy considerations are one through 11, right? And so that's really, really, really important to understand. Right. Sita, Robin, anything on that or Sita? I was going to say, Robin, you should go first. I'm really curious to hear what you have to say and then I can round it up. Yeah, um, I think, I think, I think it's a very important point. I think, and I think that like, it's always worth it, even because right now, what's why people are really bringing up the First Amendment, especially within the last couple of weeks uh, with Trump, is because the conversation is focused so specifically on two thirty reform and um, and what should be done about that, and really what are the like what are the, the kind of specific rights that these companies have versus don't have. And I completely agree with Arkan. We don't want, you know, if we, we don't want businesses to be denying people things on the basis of their, their gender, their sexual orientation, then we don't really want platforms to be doing that as well. I think when it comes to Trump specifically, and a lot of the people who got kicked off in the last week, it's a difference between uh, 
allowing viewpoints to exist online and allowing calls to violence to exist online. And one of like the, the more interesting things that, that was that you could see was that there is a um, there was this account that was called like uh, President Trump suspend or something like that. And it was an account that was basically retweeting everything that Trump would say um, and seeing how long it would take for him to get suspended. And he got suspended three times um, over the course of, of Trump's presidency for for what um, for what he said. And Trump did not did not get suspended at all. And I think that's also a big complaint that people have online is that that platforms have these rules, but they're being applied to different people differently. And in a large portion of the time, the powerful are the ones that the rules do not apply to, um, which is kind of really turning this like this thing on, on its head. And in media policy, you think we should have higher standards for public figures, not lower. And for platforms, much of the time we have, it, at least with platforms, because of the way they're constructing their, their concept of newsworthiness, they've really made lower standards. So that's what I think people are really kind of concerned about is, is the fact that you, you have these platforms that are saying we're well, that really, really, they, they have a place a huge emphasis on procedural fairness. It's like been a big thing. And I think part of that is that they're actually working, some of them are working with um, Tom Tyler um, to develop some of these, some of these ideas, but um, they really want to have these even rules, but, they, but they're not, they're not. Um, and platforms are doing this kind of interesting thing where they're reinserting the gatekeeping function in, in a lot of different ways around very particular topics. Um, like COVID um, and the election, they did that as well, but they've also been working with media companies. A lot of the platforms have been working with media companies because they have financial partnerships with specific users because they have different financial partnerships. So it is not it is not an even field um, by any means. And whether or not you get your content taken down and then whether or not you're able to get an, an appeal through is highly dependent on your relationship with that company. And that is dependent on power. And that's my thoughts. I couldn't agree with that yeah. more, right? And and especially, I mean, actually, in the interviews that we did for our data bodies, um, we found, you know, a couple of people mentioned, in, especially in Detroit, you know, I'm not really sure why these posts are being taken down, or in Charlotte after the uprisings, I'm not really sure why certain things are not appearing, right? And the ability for those individuals to actually, you know, winnow their way into some unknown um, platform bureaucracy or, uh, yeah, you know, um, labyrinth, right? Like that's just not going to happen. Um, I guess just to come back to the question, uh, I, I mean, I think I mentioned in my comments, right? That the public sphere ha has never been. Um, uh, or is not usually that welcoming of uh, members of marginalized communities. And so there are both, I think, advantages that you can point to with respect to these large platforms, right? So you could say that some of uh, the uprisings of the past year were really aided through and this was the case with BLM and Black Lives Matter and, and um, you know, in the post Ferguson era, right? Like there, there, there is something very genuine and important about being able to get your perspective out there. What I worry and, um, you know, think that we have historical examples to learn from, um, what I worry about is that platform companies have a power that isn't only about speech, but that gets entangled with speech. And so um, we, we, we should be asking ourselves and really thinking, how did we get to here? How did we allow this to happen? And, you know, just thinking about how platform companies sold themselves on speech. That was the PR line for 20 years, right? I mean, platform companies and um, uh, providers, telco providers before then, right? You know, and, and something has really changed. It isn't only about speech, it's about um, speech power and a, a, a type of um, economic power that I think we haven't seen before. Um, thanks, Sita. I, I actually think uh, I'll just use moderator's prerogative here. It's also very much, and we're seeing this more and more in the pandemic highlights it, I think in, in very powerful ways, um, that the framing it entirely around speech is also not getting us toward solutions. Um, and the technology itself, the companies we need to be talking about 
have left the screen also. We're talking about companies that build tools very much designed to digitize our physical spaces um, and to mm -hmm. affect the way we organize and assemble and can even get together as a two or three or a, a bigger group of people. So I, I agree with you very much there. I think we're, we're, we're not seeing all that we need to see by focusing solely on speech. There's some very big questions in the Q&A, so I'm going to try to meld them a little bit. Um, but I wanna start with one that starts with a direct uh, focus on you, Sita, about this idea of refusal and how do we theorize access to refusal? Who can refuse and what must be the prerequisites for that? And are there ways in which it gets so entangled with this uh, the broader question of access, which you mentioned. And I'll start with Sita and then if Robin and Arkan have thoughts on that as well. That is such a great question and a really tough one um, because there, there, there have been moments in my journey as a scholar where I've thought, um, you know, we, we, we should be learning and we should be thinking and we should be researching communities that have very little access, right? And, and, and it seems like for many years, we, we kind of left that behind, um, at least in the United States, right? We mm -hmm. don't know um, as much as we need to know. And when we do research it, it's usually from this lens of, you know, you need that access, you need, you know, and, and I'm not denying that at all, right? It's impossible to be homeschooling a kid right now without access to reliable broadband. There's no question about that. But I do wonder, and certainly in the work that I've done um, with our data bodies and, and organizing communities in general, you know, I think part of um, what we try to think about is where have we organized already? Where have we actually, you know, what are we already doing to meet the needs of our communities? And that's not to say that I support only, you know, sort of these, um, like a communitarian understanding of what democracy ought to be. It's just that we can learn a lot from communities that haven't had access or, and from communities that have deliberately um, shut out certain kinds of access, right? And um, that that I think can inform, um, you know, our own consumption habits, uh, where we put emphasis. It's al almost a question of when do we need that access and when do we need to refuse it? And do we actually have the right to refuse it? And what is enabling that right of our refusal? So that's how I would answer that question. Arkan, Robin? Nope, okay. Um, we uh, have three more minutes. So let's how quickly we can uh, get into some of the questions. There's a very specific question and I'll ask it to all three of you, which is um, if, uh, where did it go? If there are um, examples of um, platform design, technology design, moderator tools, and I'll add in here governance processes, um, that are actually achieving any of the goals each of you is interested in. In other words, are there, are there good things we could look to? <laughs> are there good examples of where maybe a better relationship, a more democratic, equitable um, uh, relationship exists between communities and certain technology tools? Um, the, the specific question from Matthew asked, like there's a, a design trade-off between breadth and ease of use readability, but given your uh, expertise and the breadth of domains you've touched on, I think it goes far beyond that. But any last uh, comments before I turn this back to Rob? I guess that speaks mostly to my work. Uh, I've always really struggled with this, this question um, because I think that with all of the models that I've studied, there's, there's trade-offs. Um, and I, I think actually the reason why I've struggled with it more is that in a lot of the way, so the design I like best is the community reliant forms. It's really great um, to have communities kind of building their own structures, doing their own norm building. Of course, there's a, a, a like a very um, urgent labor um, problem with how uh, platforms use the labor of, of volunteers. 
Um, but I also think because community reliant moderation, uh, it, it, it ends up showing some of the problems with kind of creating an ideal anyway, because in most of those cases, those um, the way that those platforms are, are, are governed, who has the time to actually do the moderation, it ends up actually reproducing many of the same power dynamics that exist offline. Um, and so I think it's, it's a problem to posit any of these as an ideal, that like any of these kinds of ways, if we could only perfectly design the, the perfect system and we would solve all problems, it's just, it's like a, it, it's just not possible. Um, and many of the problems that exist offline are, are the problems that exist are, that exist online. Um, so I have, I have a real, I have a real hard, hard time answering this question. I'm sorry. Thanks, Robin. Arkan? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, and I like Matthew's formulation. I think that it, it's it's premature that how how we should be thinking about is not what are the tools or specific solutions, but what are the processes to get to some of these values that we're aiming toward. And let me just take the platform part of it, right? I think that um, in Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, there are many teams trying to optimize for many things like engagement, like sales, uh, uh, many, many, uh, like uh, uh, user stickiness, many, many different dimensions. And so I guess I would like to see what if in each of those platforms, we had a dozen teams and each of those teams had an ethicist, a data scientist uh, and a software engineer, and they were doing A-B testing. And they picked one of the Democrat, one of the many democratic values on my list, like truth orientation. And I bet, you could get truth at orientation in your YouTube algorithm or in your Twitter algorithm cranked up 20, 30, 40% in about five weeks if you just put your mind to it with those teams of people, right? So the moderation, I guess, for me is trimming at the edges of what you regard as false or fake news or hateful or harmful. But the whole iceberg is about the content itself. Are we being civil to one another? Are we orienting toward truth? Are we getting towards some kind of common good discussion? And so what can we do as citizens? What can regulators do? But here I'm focused particularly on what platforms could do to up their democratic quotient if they really tried um, in the 90% of the iceberg that's under the water, not on the noisy, hateful, false Russian bot troll farm stuff, but in the in the algorithm itself, right? I mean, we know that 70% of views on YouTube are um, not organic, right? They're stuff that the algorithm feeds you, not on what you choose yourself. So let's like, and many of our feeds are that way. So how can we increase the democratic quality of those feeds? It's just not a problem I think people are trying to solve, but why not? Sita, last word on that question. <laughs> Gosh, that's such a complex question. Um, I, I don't know if I have a great answer except for to say all of these really hard questions that we're asking of now ought to be asked for technologies coming down the line. So I'm just thinking of quantum internet, right? Like, let's have that conversation now. Let's think about the investment strategies. Let's think about how the, this innovation is being um, you know, not only technically designed, but marketed, right? Like, how are we understanding the benefits of this innovation to society, right? We ought to be very meticulously um, capturing all of the questions that we've had and all of the learnings that we've had over the last 20, um, 20 25 years with respect to digital technology and this very, you know, um, different trajectory that we are now on than I think we first started out with all of our optimistic um, understandings and discussion about the information superhighway, right? We really need to be thinking about these questions and, and applying them to the things that are coming down the pike. So while the, the, there is a lot of urgency around thinking about platforms and platform governance, there's a lot more that's on its way and, and a lot more that's already kind of being put into place, partly because of where we are with respect to the pandemic and how reliant we've become on technology. <laughs>
Thank you, Sita. I want to echo that. I think um, one of the things that came up quite a bit, both through the process of writing the book and also Rob and our uh, third co-editor, Ellen Landamore, had, <clears throat> had the opportunity to rewrite the introduction once the book was, was finished. So when the introduction is probably the most recently written um, part of the book. And I, I hope we made that point that there's actually, um, there was scholarship largely coming from black women and women of color scholars um, 20 years ago that told us about the content moderation problems we'd be having and, and facing today. And uh, we shouldn't repeat that same mistake. We should be doing that work absolutely now on the pervasive nature of, of computing and its interactions in our social life. I wanna thank all of those of you who put questions in the question box and particularly just call out for the panelists to take a look at. I don't know what we're gonna do with this Q and A and we're not gonna to get to it all, but there's a really strong question. I think a wonderfully phrased question to the heart what's often sort of dismissed as naivete and the good nativeness and positivity centered white supremacy as a defining characteristic, at least in the US where so many of these technologies are built. Um, what kind of logic might that have um, led us to uh, uh, build off of and, and re reimagine uh, the, what we built and, and where we're going, or at least how we understand it. So I wanna thank uh, Sita, Arkan, and Robin, thank Data and Society. I'm gonna pass it back to Rob Reich for the last comments. Thank you so much. Thanks for this terrific conversation, um, both uh, the audience contributions and then all of the contributors here. Uh, uh, thanks to Data and Society, as well as Stanford PAX uh, for co-hosting the event. I'll make one final comment by way of conclusion, which is that um, my takeaway lesson from the two plus years of thinking about this project and working on the book and now hearing this conversation is that what we come to at this moment is the urgent need for a multidisciplinary research agenda that brings together a variety of different scholars in the spirit of this book, but this is just a starting point because there are both normative questions, social scientific questions and technical questions and the intersection at the bare minimum of those three orientations is what's necessary in my view to try to deliver ourselves a future where digital technologies will help democracies and citizens flourish rather than suffer. So takeaway lesson number one is the urgent need for a research agenda of the sort that this volume represents. And number two, I'll just mention that I think um, we finally indeed are emerging with a, you know, here in the United States with a Biden administration into a moment in which a sort of sober and mature stock taking of where we stand is possible. So for those of us in the academy, the work that we can do is involves not only the research and the research agenda I just mentioned, but also a, a, a curricular um, change so that the technologists that get trained, perhaps especially at an institution at the, like the one that I teach at Stanford, which has provided so many of the engineers that populate the companies that have created and, and distributed the technologies we've been discussing, aren't just oriented towards questions of optimizing their technological designs alone. And as Archon and others mentioned at the start, the idea of combining um, ethical, social scientific, um, media and communications, STS, um, um, plus engineering expertise within companies, as well as within public agencies, is also an urgent task for all of us. So we have so much work to do in front of us, um, and I mean that as a big collective we. And I want to thank everyone for being a part of the conversation. I, I hope the book is of interest to anyone who takes a chance to, to look at it. And uh, I'll just signal, certainly from my point of view, um, I, my contact information is super easy to find online. I welcome any um, comments, um, thoughts, uh, proposals. Uh, um, contact me. Would love to be in dialogue with you. So thank you all. So as a reminder, uh, the book will come out next month on February 5th, but we'd like to offer all of you a discount code of 30% off for your participation today. And here's the beautiful book again. I think I'm the only one of us who actually has a copy, a physical copy. So here it is. Um, a link to the publisher's site is uh, on the chat where you can redeem your copy of the book using the code D-T-A-N-D-D-T. -D -D and thank you all for joining us and have a great day. Mm -hmm.